Hi guys, welcome. Today, hi Marie. I can see Heidi and it looks like Danny and Tracy and Mary and Kelly and Rebecca and Nicole. I feel like I'm doing romper room through a mirror. And Catherine Lim. I'm just going to give a couple people another couple of minutes. So we'll start at 6.35. So you've got time just to run, guys, to get a cup of tea or anything that you need, or a glass of wine, if that's what you would like. Dawn Marie's got a glass of wine there. No, I haven't. I'm being good. Oh, are you being good? I hate being good. <laughs> <laughs> I, was going to th I thought you were going to say, no, I've got two glasses. <laughs> <laughs> got the bottle. No, I've got nothing. <laughs> That's all right. Let's wait for a couple more minutes. All right, lovely message from Nicole saying she's zooming in from Rundry country. Welcome, Nicole. And yet, yeah, please do not put the camera on while you're driving. So it'd be good if you, if you were just listening. Thank you. Like a radio station tuning in. This is AJ and Ajax's ser series number seven. Welcome. Oops, I can see Mary sideways. Let's give people another two minutes and then we'll start. Okay, guys, welcome. It is 6.35, so I'm going to start the workshop tonight. Um, just before I do start, I would like to acknowledge the tradition known as the land that I'm currently on. I'm here in Baldwin Q in the land of the Rundry people. I elders past, present and emerging. I extend that to the lands that you're currently calling in from because we, we know that you're coming from all over Victoria. So I pay respect to their elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge any other Aboriginal people that are here tonight, but also acknowledge the lands where you may have come from and grown up on because that might be completely different to where you are. And I pay respect to your elders past and present because they help shape who you became today. Um, for people that don't know me, uh, my name is AJ, AJ Wynn. Uh, my background's Redry and Watcher Bullock. My family come from Dimbola Horsham, Dubbo Wellington area of New South Wales. Um, I was a nurse at one stage, so I was a maternal health nurse. Um, I am now a mental health uh, social worker. And I'm part of Ajax's uh, reconciliation ambassador team, who are, and I'm also here to present the um, the series of workshops. Tonight we're up to uh, seminar number seven. The previous six have been recorded and are up on the Ajax website for you to actually have a look at at any time. Um, give us a couple of days uh, after this workshop, and this workshop will be also uploaded um, onto the onto the website. 
But tonight we've actually got um, another one of my friends. Uh, you know, I've been inviting my friends along, but I've got another one of my friends, uh, Zoe Upton. Zoe is the Curry Education Coordinator at the Department of Education and Training. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about um, how we can engage our inclusion heroes, which are the Curry uh, uh, workforce. So I'm just going to throw over to um, uh, Zoe and she can take it from there. Thanks, AJ. Uh, my name, as, as AJ said, is um, Zoe Upton. I'm a proud Bunurong Trulawai woman, which is on um, the other side of Wurundjeri country um, and heading out to the Mordialic areas and, uh, and Werribee. And then Trulawai is, which is a uh, Cape Barren Island um, in Tasmania. I have... Um, I'm at the Career Education Coordinator. I look after uh, Northeast Melbourne metro area under the Northwest Victoria banner. Um, so I, I have a team of 11 Kessos. So I I love to talk. That's why I, um, AJ decided to engage me in this space. So um, I'm open to any questions whatsoever. I am very thick skinned. I've heard it all. Um, I want you to feel safe. This is a safe place for everybody to be open and honest about what's actually happening and how they how they can actually um, engage us in a better way or engage families in a better way. Um, so in saying that, <coughs> um, and also I have to do a disclaimer, I have three toddlers. Um, they have already entered naked, so that was before everybody came in, so at least they're dressed, but they may enter again harassing me. So um, excuse if they're right at Asher, Asher and Marley, but, that yeah, they'll, um, uh, they've will they already entered a couple of times, but at least they, they, they'll be dressed this time, so that's good. Um, and also if you have any questions, please pop it in the chat or if you interrupt me, um, I, you know, am not precious at all. So um. <laughs> I'll monitor the chat and I will um, stop you every now and then for a couple of questions if people come through. Deadly. Thanks, Zoe. So um, I wanted to do an acknowledgement to country. So I'm standing on the, um, the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, I can see that um, Marie is on Wadawarang uh, country and we've got other people on um, Wurundjeri country. Um, and, um, you know, I'd like to out acknowledge elders past, present and also the emerging ones. The reason why I do say emerging is because we're all educating our future leaders. Um, we're creating that safe, you guys are creating that safe and encouraging um, educational journey to, and it starts with you fellas. So I know it's a bit of pressure, but, you know, it does. So, um, and also I'd like to acknowledge um, all, uh, um, if any other Aboriginal people are here today. Um, so look, the, the purpose of today's meeting is, um, and I've done this for a network meeting. So um, for those people in NEMA area, we can create those connections into our networks and each area does work a lot different. Um, but what I do do is at the moment is run some um, cultural inclusion practices and um, how to engage us as uh, the career workforce and then also to have those really um, transparent and safe yarns with mob um, and with our educators to actually sit there and, and, and engage families and the, and the reasons why sometimes it is challenging. Um, and I'd like to introduce Ryder to the group because Ryder is my, um, he's usually my shadow. So um, do you want to say hello? Hello. <laughs> but he's the Ryder. reason... These are, he's the reason why we're here, you know, he's a three-year-old um, using um, our early childhood services. Can you shoot, please? All right, that's not helpful, dude. Okay. Um, oh, darling. So for those people who do... Um, do acknowledge Mr Country. If you're coming along to these workshops, I'm assuming that you are doing these, um, doing the acknowledge Mr Country. It's probably nothing that you haven't learnt before or know why. Um, but it's, um, I think it's really good to just 
um, sometimes to reflect um, on the on your acknowledgement to country, mm-hmm. especially as you're moving through your inclus- inclusive um, journey. Oh, yeah. um, can you stop, please? Because now you uh, oh, should like. Um, and also, you know, why do we do it? Do, um, so as AJ, AJ has explained, why does anybody have any questions as to why we do an acknowledgement to the country? No? I'm, I'm happy to. So back in the old times where we would travel and barter and um, negotiate marriage and talk about ceremony with other mobs or go, you know, have to walk through other people's countries, we would sit on the outskirts of of country um, and the borders. So they would be either, you know, marked by a scar tree or a river or a mountain and things like that. And we would sit there and light a fire and um, wait and wait for people to come, the allocated elders to come around. And when they finally did get there, it could be, you know, lucky that we got to see them within a day, but it could have been a couple of days is explain our purpose of going through country, so all the reason to visit and have a yarn. And then they would smoke us to ensure that there was no um, spirits or anything bad attached to us as we walked through. And then they would either let us on, give, give us permission to go on. As colonisation occurred, obviously we don't have that same luxury of doing that. But we have we are an amazing um, people, and we've evolved. And um, it probably became more prevalent okay. in the in 1996, 1997. Okay. Go and harass, go and harass other people in the house. Um, and um, yeah, so we've evolved. And after the long walk, um, we started doing those acknowledgements to country. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in government and wherever we are. And so it's really nice to actually know the reasons why we actually do do um, acknowledgement to country. Um, and, of course, every, does everybody know who can do an acknowledgement to country and who um, and what the difference is between acknowledgement and welcome? Yeah. Um, so that's fantastic. So I'm standing on Wurundjeri country. So this is, oh, my gosh, sorry about this. I have a double head. I'm really sorry. I hope you're finding this absolutely entertaining. (laughs) Um, And um, obviously when we follow our protocols and when when I yarn a bit more about protocols and engaging um, inclusion in your services, um, you know, we, we do try and engage our our traditional owners as much as we can Um, and then we can talk about more of that later. And there's an early years example of an acknowledgement to country Um, and some acknowledgement plaques. I don't know, has anybody ever seen these acknowledgement plaques? These are the old school tin ones from Anta, which is about 40 bucks back in the day. Um, and then we've got our um, contemporary artists like Kenya Lurk, and they have got these incredible um, laminated and they can actually tailor their um, acknowledgements to your service. They are a little bit more expensive, but they do range in sizes. It's always good to see examples, I think. Um, Also, there's, you know, um, other acknowledgements that you can do by engaging local um, artists and they don't always have to be um, the written version but they can be this beautiful iron that's made out of um, so yeah and that was all um, approved by with local elder um, the Koori families work together with the with the actual artist so we all sit under the Department of Education and Training and um, one of the, um, and I'm not sure if anybody uh, is aware of the Marung Educational Plan. It's not a strategy, it is a plan and the, um, it's the very first educational plan that the Department of Education has ever consulted with our um, 
with our trailblazing organisations like VACA, um, VACHO, VAR, um, oh, VAI, I should say VAI, <laughs> and, um, and they all fit really perfectly into the education state targets. So we've got the rich and thriving culture of knowledge and experience of our First Nations peoples that are celebrated by all Victorians. So that includes if you don't have any career students attending your early year services, is educating our mob, educating our future leaders, regardless of whether or not they are career or not. Our universal systems are inclusive, responsive and respectful of Kuru people at every stage of their learning and development journey. And, of course, that is, you know, um, referring back to breaking the link. It doesn't matter where you come from or what your upbringing is, we want you to succeed. Every Kuru person achieves their potential, succeeds in life and feels strong in their cultural identity, which refers back to the resilience. And we're pretty resilient mob. Um, and, um, you know, it's just about whether or not, you know, people feel confident and safe in your services to divulge that. So I do like to ensure that we do um, highlight my room. There's some um, amazing things occurring in the department. I don't need to get out that side. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Sorry, everybody. Can you get off? No. Come on, darling. Mm. Off you go. Mm. I'm sure Dad's got something cool for you. Go get a lolly. Oh, go. Get lollies. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm sorry, AJ. <laughs> All right. Um, we are halfway through this plan, so we've got another um, another four years to go. Um, and within that, it is there we do have some scholarships that are available for our kindergarten teachers, for Aboriginal people to get our Aboriginal um, teachers in the kindergarten services and become part of part of the system to teach. And then we won't have to necessarily worry about engaging our Kapuri workforce just because you've already got it in within your services and ultimately want to do myself out of a job. Um, so VAI would have come in, um, I, I know that they came in a couple of sessions ago, is that right, AJ? So um, the obviously VAI is our overarching peak body of the education for Kapuri learners and they um, and they work towards the Marung. We work towards Marung as well and the targets and, and the roles, but also we um, we work in partnership with, with VAI. So we have um, in Marung we've got a really strong governance um, structure where our LAECG chairs, which are volunteers, usually elders within our community, sit at the table with the Kessos, and community at our LAECG meetings, then goes up to what we call our MATE, um, which is the Morong Area Implementation Team, and that sits with our area directors. And then it goes up to our Regional Partnership Forum, which sits with our, um, our Regional Director, and then it goes up all the way up to the Secretary. And it just shows that, that you know, our voices are finally being pulled to the table and, and, and being heard. Um, it's still a lot of work to do in that space, um, but I think it's um, really important that we do um, that we do acknowledge that we've come a long way, especially in the Morong Plan. Um, we also deliver the community understanding and safety training initiative that it's actually been um, mandated through every single Victorian um, government school. Uh, and in my area, I have four schools left to do out of 160. So we are starting to now look at our early years services and how we can actually help improve um, our connections into our early years services to create that same space. But in my area, just alone, there's 300 early, early years services. So we need to be a bit more strategic in the way that we actually deliver it instead of a four hour face to face training. Um, uh, you know, I've only got a case, I've only got case host 11 people, and I'm five down at the moment. <laughs> so, but 
it is an amazing initiative and now we're seeing schools implement NAIDOC days and NAIDOC um, events and Sorry Day events and just, you know, these particular murals and things like that, that deadly education plans, which is amazing. Um, <clears throat> so I want to acknowledge that we do have, there's a lot of resources out there and in particular there's um, there's someone on Facebook that does the career curriculum, um, which has amazing um, resources in, in her um, Facebook page and, and her website. Um, I will acknowledge, though, that she's um, New South Wales. So um, I wanted to share our Victorian um, childhood, um, cultural early childhood pro protocols. And there are some differences and and. And because of the different mobs and the way that um, consultation has occurred with um, VAI and um, our Koori community, our protocols are slightly different. Um, so I encourage you to, to read through it. If you have any questions, please reach out to myself or someone like Kim Powell, who can actually, you know, step you through those protocols as well. And we can deliver, you know, the Kessos can actually say, yes, you know, I, I think that's a really great idea or maybe we might need to get a bit of permission in that. And one of the things I do explain to, um, to schools and to early years services, you offend when you don't. So I always say you can always apologise for saying we're under the wrong way or not 100% knowing what country you're sitting on but trying to acknowledge that you're standing on Aboriginal land. Um, but if you don't acknowledge us, that's more offensive because it's like we don't exist. Um, so um, Anani Ros Gardner, who, who, who has a parent, who's just passed away recently, she used to come up to our, um, our casts and, and she would just say, just get out there and do it. Uh, but she would add an expletive in there. Um, and, you know, we acknowledge her um, for all of her incredible work that she's done, um, you know, for 25 years. So if you don't know, if you haven't got a copy of this, um, it is on our VAI website. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I'll also send you through the link um, for our KEX. So my equivalents, there's... Um, we have four areas, and within the four areas, I think we have four or five KECs sitting um, in the in those particular areas. So I will send that list off. If you don't know, just contact your local debt office and they will connect you. Um, I just want to show you this is uh, our pre-contact um, out and each colour represents different um, language group and different laws, different cult customs. And this, this reflects back to even things like, you know, in, in Victoria we use uh, possum skin cloaks, but up north they use more of the kangaroo um, cloaks as well. Um, and also that we, you know, we traded um, and we utilised our services really, you know, our resources really well and shared them as well. So and that's, that's, um, that is apparent and from the discovery of the Victorian Greenstones all, all the way up north. Um, so I always try and make sure that everybody understands, like this, this, this training is two-hour training, so um, I've got to fit you know, how you engage with uh, your local inclusion heroes and to be able to give you some context in um, for 60,000 years in, in an hour. So, um, you know, excuse me if I'm just running through, if you have any questions, and, of course, I'm more than happy to share um, this content um, with everybody as well because uh, the more people know, um, the better we, we all are. Um, so we know Mungo Man. Um, was found and he's about 68,000 years old and he disproved the, um, I'm sorry, everyone. Okay, but I can't deal with you right now. There's another adult in the house. Um, and we know that there's digs that, found, that have found Aboriginal habitation for 80,000 years and I think there's been a recent discovery of um, and um, which actually 
has been predated beyond any of those, um, but I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that is. We know that um, self-determination is a really big uh, direction for our government at the moment um, and, and really been a determination for us as Aboriginal people for forever. Um, we want to be able to decide and um, have voices heard at the table, um, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to government oh, policies sense. around our people mm -hmm. and ourselves in our lives. Oh, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to capture, you know, when we've got, uh, you know, our mob being removed from our own countries and um, the policies and procedures that actually policies were put in place um, throughout the 1700s through the 1900s to today even. Um, and we also know that our men uh, struggle with this a lot because, we, you know, culturally they were here to provide us with um you know, our food, um, our laws and, um, you know, keep us safe as, as mob and we've displaced them. Um, and our mob just don't, like our men don't really know where they fit in, in, in the society, you know, through our DNA. Um, Transgenerational trauma has been proven to be in our DNA and um, being um, a grandchild and a child of a stolen generation um and a sibling yeah. of stolen generation um no, this is that? very uh prominent no, for my what's life that? What's that? nothing so uh again this is talking about those particular policies and procedure um, policies that um protected us um but it also meant that we actually had to ask for permission to actually leave our missions and um co um our missions and reserves but also if we wanted to um, get a job, um, try and provide for our family, we actually had to get permission for that, but also we had to sign a waiver that actually made us exempt from all the curfews and, and things like that and to get a job and live off the mission. But it also meant that we had to sign away um, any acknowledgement of who we are and it also meant that we weren't allowed to associate with family, community or any of those things. And that's why, you know, a, a lot of time people may, may come out last moment, so, you know, so I just found out. And that's because actually no one told them um, they had to pretend for such a long time. And these policies and procedures and policies, um, you know, really embed today's society. Um, these are just those particular uh, policies that en enabled government to remove children. And um, this wasn't, you know, a lot of the time it says things like, you know, illegitimate children or if there was proven to be um, mistreatment um, or physical welfare of the children. Sometimes the physical welfare of the children was deemed to be a risk because they were Aboriginal or because um, even today we look at it. So I, I'll give an example of a contemporary issue. Can you please shoot one? <laughs> and that is that um, we worked with a family, um, with a, a young mother who had an intellectual dis um, disability and um, she would be feeding her baby and one of our ref references is, oh, you know, we'll just chuck the baby on the titty. And that's just the way that we talk. Um, and child protection and um, all the officials involved with this young woman, because she did have an inte intellectual disability, found that to be um, speaking sexualised to the child. So we, when we look at those sorts of things, and, and that child was removed. Now, for us as Aboriginal people, that just wouldn't, wouldn't have happened, you know, um, if they had consulted appropriately with people around her. Um, also note that um, we um, these policies were stopped in 1957 in Victoria, but the last um, home, uh, Yalambi, was um, closed in the 90s. So we've still got very young stolen generation people out there. My brother is not yet 50. Um, 
How much time have we got? Has there any questions thus far? Um, I've got three that have been thrown at us already. Yes. Uh, the first one is, uh, I wrote down here, what do, uh, you talked about the acknowledgement. How do we ensure that we do an acknowledgement from the heart rather than just reading it? Yes, and um, at the start there I did show you different ways of uh, personalising it to your service. So, you know, uh, personalising it with the values of the service. So, you know, um, sustainability or, you know, um, th there is some, ex I do have some examples where, you know, the, here is the sun, um, here is the earth, here are my friends and here and I. And then you, you're thanking the Wurundjeri country. But also I think it's about understanding why you do it. And that's why I try and explain to people, you know, the reasons why, it's important for us as Aboriginal people because once you understand that, you actually feel more empowered to tailor it to your service. Also, I think it's not just about the children doing it in your classrooms, but it's also about having it on your websites or on your newsletters or when you're doing your family days and Mother's Day stalls and all of those sorts of things or carols or any of those things is actually doing it all there as well um, and it may feel tokenistic at the start and you may need to read it at the start but as you become more confident in that and, and you understand that tokenism is the start of it you're always going to feel tokenistic when you start something it's when you start doing it without even thinking about it um, that you take those next steps or you know um, you start then embedding it into your everyday. Um, and that's um, that's how you make it authentic. That's how you make it genuine and, and, and with heart. Um, I hope that answers it. Uh, the second question was, how do we, how can we start to incorporate Indigenous perspectives into what we do? Sure. So I think it's about... Um, uh, so, okay, um, for instance, when we're working at the Valdiv and you're acknowledging and you're thinking about, so someone's thrown me um, a chart, this little boy is interested in this today. Can someone throw me something that this little boy is interested in? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Thank you. <laughs> and so we then look at dinosaurs and then we look at, um, well, what does that look like back when um, Aboriginal people before colonisation, you know, and then you can look at things like the crocodile and that was a food for, for Aboriginal people and then you can then incorporate what does that look like when you're eating crocodile or, um, you know, you're going up north and you're actually looking at these waterholes that look absolutely pristine. But if you speak to the locals, um, you will get eaten. <laughs> so you can actually then refer it back to those, you know, crocodiles are our, uh, were around through dinosaur ages and then you can actually associate, you know, all of that into their, into that space as well. Um, so it's just about, I suppose, having that confidence and, and, and utilising the resources that um, are given, that, that, that are available. So we've give, you know, I'll give you the VAI website with the curriculums and things like that. There is an early childhood space there. Come along and have a yarn with our Kessos. Um, you know, it, it could be just doing one little thing a week and then you say, okay, well, that was quite, that was much easier than what I thought. Yeah. We'll go so you, yeah. Uh, Zoe, can you hear me, guys, okay? So we... Um, <sighs> When I'm trying to teach and embed our Aboriginal culture within the kindergartens when I was teaching, um, we'd have sort of the, the, the colonised version of something. So, for example, buildings, and then we'd also have the resource that was of what Aboriginals would have back in the days, you know, those straw huts, those stone huts, um, but also the tools, you know, whilst they didn't have knives and forks, they had sticks and spears and, and that sort of stuff. So we always had it available so that, it's not just a learning experience, it's it's there, it's always available. You could use your knife and fork if you wanted to or you could use um, maybe not quite in a childcare setting but you could use um, 
a stick to eat with or, you know, build it onto those different cultures as well. But yeah. just having the the two that you can sort of compare to is one way of of doing it. But different clothing, different materials, the paints, rather than having your acrylics, it's, you know, go out and crush up some mud and leaves and make paint through that way. Um, yeah. That's how we sort of did it in our services. And that's amazing. And even just having more earthy tones um, with your, um, with, say even just your signing sheets and and welcomes and and things like that walking in and and having your local language so you know um in Wurundjeri country it's woman jika um but also understanding what does that mean like it's not just welcome there's another meaning behind um woman jika and i can't remember it. i know that you know aj so i'm gonna hand it over to you i'm with a purpose yeah, come with a purpose. So it's about welcoming and becoming coming with a purpose. And I think that's really important. Like when I walk into services as an Aboriginal woman, I want to see my colours being represented. I want to see you using bark and all this sort of stuff. So I, I've got, um, you know, three toddlers who all attend um, a, a childcare service out where I am. And I just, I literally just said to them, can I take over your reception over in NADOC? And they said, absolutely. So I had Aboriginal colour stream, um, you know, the flag streamers across there, the flag that the kids I made, um, done, sat down with the kids and they'd done of both the Torres Strait Islander and, and the Aboriginal flag. And then I had Torres Strait Islander um, uh, streamers. This didn't cost anything, by the way, so it's not a cost. Then I um, got old boxes and painted them black then took it to another room where I've got the kids to actually put their feet in white paint and walk along the blackness. Um, so it was like this big trail. And, and then the, the kids wanted to say, uh, we walk together. So that was, you know, we, it's those sorts of things that end up being, that's part of your curriculum because we did activities in each, um, utilising books that are out there because we have got, an abundance of books out there now. Back when I, you know, 10 years ago when I first started as a Kesso, there just wasn't that much. And now you're just influxed with it everywhere. And it's beautiful, beautiful books. So um, I hope that helped start your fire because that certainly is not the ending or anything all in between. But um, I just thought as well, because we've talked about stolen generations, um, you know, and I want you to think and reflect where you were. And I can't see everybody. I can only see a few people. I'm hoping some, most people were alive um, when uh, the, the Rudd uh, apology occurred. If not, and you haven't seen this video, then um, I, and hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Let me just check first. Tell me if you can hear it. I'm tired. No, I can't hear? Okay. You can't hear that? Hey, Zoe, we'll put up a copy onto the website. As Perfect. Well as All right. I do have some other questions for you. Oh, Perfect. Um, to be sending through direct. So one of them is, and I think you've answered this before, but it'd be really good because the person who's asking this, uh, Victorian government has been saying, do not, you don't have to acknowledge future and emerging elders. You mentioned in your speech about acknowledging them, and the person just what said, when we yes. the country, do we um, elders emerging and future as well? Look. You don't look I, I do I do um I th it, it is what the reason and I do explain why I do um and the reason why I do it is because we are in the education sector and we are educating our future leaders you should block otherwise you can go lie down come on enough sorry second one um and um, I, that's why I do, I do acknowledge um, our emerging leaders. I don't find it offensive. Some people um, do 
do. I, I'm not, I don't really understand why. Um, and I'm sure there's a full good reason for it because, um, but I do and I explain why. I do know that um, that's the reason why I explain that I'm working with our future leaders. I am working with our emerging leaders. and But also that um, that doesn't displace. Excuse me, please, Asha. That's it. Um, that doesn't displace um, our past, um, you know, um, leaders. Um AJ, can you elaborate why people don't want? Um... Um, I'm not exactly sure, but there has been a. I've seen a couple of government Victorian yeah. statements coming out saying it can be really offensive to current elders and by then... emerging, emerging elders because they're not elders. Mm -hmm. During NADOC, I did two events. One that was chaired. One I was moderating both, but one of them. Ani Dai was talking about, and she she was kind of shocked when she said, "Well, why wouldn't be? Why wouldn't we?" And at the next event, Ani Joy was talking, and someone mentioned as well the same thing. We've been told not to use emerging, and Ani Joy said, "For Rundry, if you're on Rundry land, we would want you to acknowledge our emerging elders because they're the, they're our future." Yes. So I'm not exactly sure where the Victorian government's come up with the. The policy of who they consulted with about not using it. Yes, yeah. Um, but I, I've always grown up uh, acknowledging emerging leaders at the same time. Mm, I've always done it as well. I'm certainly not. Um, and, and as I always say to people, um, if someone tells you off, oh, all you have to do is say sorry. Can you educate me why? Um, if you're doing that, um, you are. Oh, here we are. Good. <laughs> got the acknowledgement happening um you know I, I always say you can say sorry and, and please if you um do it with an open heart with, with the the one can you just shoot okay you're a very distracting child shoot fly i love you guys another question someone's put through is can we use language in our service or do we need permission to use language? Really amazing question. There, if you're standing on Wurundjeri country, Mandy Nicholson has gifted to the early years services some language, so you can always find them. Um, and that was gifted to the early, early childhood sector. Um, in relation to things like Womanjenka, which is, um, you know, uh, it's, it's Woiwurrung, but also it is actually Bunwurrung language as well, um, that is stuff that, that that word is actually on big um, welcomes into, into different towns and things like that. You can always double-check with Wurundjeri or council, but, you know, it, it is at that particular word has been gifted to to basically everyone and and it has it, it has been published on you know um you know townships and and things like that or you're standing on uh jaja Warang country or you know water Warang country um and so those those particular words not a problem if you're wanting to let's say uh name name your rooms um, in in language and things like that, I would always consult our Kesso and just have a look at making sure that, number one, you're using the right language and right word for it um, and for that particular, you know, room and just do that engagement process with the LAECG and also with the traditional owners of the language that you're actually wanting to, um, to, to do it. And, and sometimes it would be just a matter of sending an email. Sometimes it might be a bit more of a consultation of why you want to do it. Is it part of your wrap? Is it part of this and that? Um, also, in as well, isn't there, Zoe? That sometimes there's a cost. Sometimes there is a cost. Yes. So if the, um, I know that we're under um, there is a cost. Um, for those sorts of naming buildings and things like that, um, which we can go 
And again, it's about engaging with um, your queso, um, myself, or you know, someone my my equivalent. Um, Go. Sorry. She was, it was like she was going <laughs> to go right there. <laughs> so, um, and, um, yeah, so sometimes there is a cost to it. I, I have found that if you engage your engage, um, Wurundjeri or, or your traditional owner um, and really explain what you're doing and, and what your purpose is and things like that, they, they're really open to have that negotiation. So um, I know that an um, uh, uh, early childhood centre out in, um, in Lilydale, they engaged um, Wurundjeri and, and uh, Kesso and they were really um, amazed at that they got to use those words that Manti had actually gifted them, gifted the, the community and, and do with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, just a quick question. Should you think if the words have been gifted by a particular elder that comes to your service to make sure that's clearly understood? Because I do know that over time uh, workers come and go and elders come and go as well. So I've actually heard elders say to people, and this is where they might get played against each other a couple of times when one of the elders is going, where did you, who, who's giving you permission to use this? Where oh, we don't know. We've had, we've been using it for a number of, a number of years. And they go, well, unless you know, and I'm saying any, everybody would need to know in the service who's gifted these words, because some of the elders found it quite um, upsetting that organisations are using these words, say that they're gifted, but not saying who they're gifted by. Yeah. So basically it's, it, it is about, um, I suppose, you know, what I would always think um, like with Aboriginal children um, doing your individual education plan is that you're doing individual um, like services inclusion plans where you, you're actually documenting, you know, the curriculum that you're embedding or, um, you know, the elders that you're engaging to to do those dream time, um, you know, to do those the story times and things like that. Also, you know, if you've had an Indigenous garden, you're going to want to know the plants that are in there and, um, you know, so that you can pass it on to the next person because hopefully, you know, not everybody's going to be in the same role forever. Um and, and be in the same service, things happen. So it's about really sitting and, and acknowledging it. I think as well, like, it's about a, a documenting the process. And if you're utilising the cultural protocols, you're engaging with particular people of, communi of the community and then you're getting the permission through people like, you know, the LAECG. If you turn around and said, if you know, you're confident that the service is actually done the cultural protocols, then you're, you know, um, you, you're most, you, you know, you're going to be getting the right permissions. But I agree. If, say, Uncle Roy Maynard, um, I'm just talk, talking about my, one of my uncles who would do this, he'd come in and say, hey, yeah, you can have this, 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 this and this, and then, um, you know, Eddie Maynard came in, you know, 10 years later and set up, I don't know why he would do that. So, <laughs> but it's just about actually really sitting down and saying, well, I consulted with them. I then went to the LAECG. They said that was fine. Um, and I engaged with the career services, the career workforce at department. And that protects everybody involved, not just you, you guys, but also, you know, the elder that's involved and, you know, things like that. Because we do have some wayward elders too. Yeah. So Nicole's just put up, I would wonder, I wonder if it, it would be appropriate to utilise professional signage to celebrate the gift of language and state the elder's name. I would say, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the and, beautiful. Uh, I think Danny sent a message through to every, from everyone. I think sometimes this can be this can make educators fearful to embed Aboriginal perspectives into curriculum because they might feel they're doing it wrong with respect to Aboriginal people. Mm. Um, I, and I agree. Um, there is parts of, can I just pop you on mute? mute? I'm just going to tell someone to get the child toilet paper. Hang on a sec. So, uh, Paige. I'll just, while she's talking. Um, can you uh, get toilet paper for Asha, please? In my mute no. 
<laughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> but I do think it's it, uh, that uh, some educators are scared to uh, embed it. It's kind of mandatory to embed it. So we've got to look at how do we start to get through that uncomfortableness? Because I think part of the learning is for us to learn how to be uncomfortable. How do we then be uncomfortable so that we can become comfortable in the future? Now, we don't want to do it as in, you know, make it tokenistic. So I'm not saying all of a sudden you're teaching a little bit of maths and you go, well, Johnny has four boomerangs and Peter has seven boomerangs. How many boomerangs do we have now? <laughs> or you start doing some cooking, little cooking se segments with, with kids and you go, well, let's just let, add lemon myrtle to everything and all of a sudden it's an indigenous dish. <laughs> so, but it's, it's actually thinking, well, in the long term, how are we going to make this as part of our ongoing curriculum? And I think in the early stages, it's a bit what Zoe said before, it's okay to get it wrong. Have a go. How does it work? How did the kids engage with it? How did I as a, an educator engage with it? How did the other educators engage with it? And if we engage with it really well, then that's something that will keep in to that particular curriculum. If it doesn't go well, then sometimes it's actually looking at, well, why didn't it go well? Was it because of attitudes of other people? Was it because of certain practices that we were doing? Or we really didn't know what it was that we were doing. We found this activity and thought we knew how to implement it, but then we've tried it and then it didn't work. So I think that's when it's it's kind of important sometimes to, you know, engage the Kessos or get, um, there's, there's a number of consultants out there as well that will have a look at some of the po policies or some of the, the teaching areas to have a look at some of the activities that you do to actually go, well, how do I make it more culturally in, uh, appropriate? I was gonna say inappropriate, but culturally appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Valdiff is there too to assist in that space. Um, and um, I think as well, it's just starting little. So I know that it is, you know, I even if it's just things like learning the colours of the flag, learning the colours of the Torres Strait Islander flag. How many people know the Torres Strait Islander flag colours and what they represent? Mm. That's a good point, Zoe. Um, <coughs> I, I just went out and did cultural awareness training at uh, four services that all belong to the one umbrella, and I would say half the staff did not know what the flags meant, honestly. So even though they said, yeah, we got the flags, we promote them, it's about cultural safety, I kind of had to throw back in their face in a polite way, how culturally safe do you think I feel now knowing that you don't know what they are? And they stopped for a second and went, oh, Shit, I never thought of that. I go, so I'm going to need to tell you so that you do know. So it's not what about you. It's not what you don't know. It's what you actually need to know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I suppose for those people who don't know about the Torres Strait Islander flag and the colours that it represents, uh, the green is for the, the land um, and, the, and the green islands. Black is for the people. Blue is for the ocean. The five-pointed star represents each and every island in the Torres Strait Island. And then that horseshoe-looking um, symbol is actually called a dari. It's beautiful. It's uh, oh, amazing. It's uh, intricate in details, but that's actually a ceremony headdress. And then the white represents peace. Because Torres Strait Islanders actually experienced colonisation and settlement in a much different way nearly 100 years later. Um, they saw it as a bringing of, of, of the light um, where, you know, they weren't invaded as such. They were just uh, miss the missionaries came, came across. So, yeah, I think it's just starting little. Just start little. Um, you know, it doesn't matter, like, if you get it wrong at the start. If, you're, if your intention is with an open heart to learn, then Aboriginal people are going to be so kind in that space. I know that, um, you know, a lot of educators are a bit fearful because a lot of the time there was like, oh, I think it was probably about when my teenagers were at, at kindergarten, everything was dot painting. Absolutely everything. And then 
community came in and said, actually, no, this is not local. This is actually not our mob that, um, you know, you're doing the artwork to. And we want our local artwork done. So we don't just do dot painting. We want you to do line work. We want you to do symbols. We want to do all those sorts of things. If you do do dot painting, acknowledge that it's not Victorian. And um, I think that put a lot of fear in, um, in our educators. So I'm just watching the time. Does anyone have any final questions for Zoe? You can just take your microphones off and just yell them out if you yell like. Yell them out to me. And also I could talk underwater, so, you know. <laughs> you think I can talk. Oh. <laughs> yes. I've been pretty good the whole hour. I know. You've been very quiet. I was like, you know, me and AJ are going to be like, you know, bouncing off each other. He left it all in my arena. <laughs> um, so if you could give, if you could give um, services three tips to start the reconciliation journey or to start embedding practice, a culture into practice, how, what would you recommend? What three tips would you give us? Um, I want to just reassure um, that we're not actually, you're not teaching culture. So you're, you're teaching perspectives and, and, and curriculum. You're not teaching culture. So, you, you know, you, you, if you were teaching ceremony, that would be different. It would be a poo-poo and no-no. Um, but if you're just looking um, at, you know, singing some songs and um, that have been gift, you know, that are on YouTube and things like that, that is perfectly great. Um, get those colours in. Get, get really going um, with uh, you know, just those simple little things and get some books and represent us all. Like, you know, we're all diverse, um, you know, in our, in our, in our colours and, um, and just be, I'm doing more than three tips, by the way, AJ. I do it my way. <laughs> if you do it with an open heart as well, like do it with an open heart and, um, you know, I think that that that's the only tips I can give. Or well, consult us, talk to us. Mm, no, thanks, Zoe. Um, I know some of you have got your, your sound off. It'd be good to take your sound your mute off for a second to give uh, Zoe a bit of a round of applause for joining us tonight. <laughs> you can hear the clapping now. Sometimes we can't hear the clapping, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and thank you for your patience and kindness with toddlers. Six six fifteen is my putting my bedtime routine. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much. You did well, Zoe. You did very well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I take my hat off to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks, Zoe. Um, just let everyone remind everyone that um, the next seminar is on August the. 29th, I believe, AJ. Twenty-ninth. Twenty-ninth. Um, this recording will be put up onto the AJX website where the other six are already, and the PowerPoints that Zoe has given to us have already been transported and on its way to Alex that we put up by uh, sometime next week. Yeah, early next week, I think. Guys. Once again, I want to say thank you for hanging with us tonight. Um, we've done really well. We've got seven, seven, seven out of 12 already done. Um, we just, we, I'll be honest with you, we're having a little bit of issues with our next lot of speakers. So we're just trying to make sure that everyone's got approval to actually come and talk. Um, but there will be something on. In the, oh, if it's not what it was planned to do, I will have something else on. We have got uh, the September workshop is with the Grandmothers Against Removal. And we'll be talking a little bit more about um, how stolen generations actually impacts on the families that you're working with. Uh, and then the next two are about embedding uh, perspectives into curriculum, where we're going to actually have some guest speakers come in, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander speakers. And so it'll be done in part, like a part one version on one night. The next month will be like part two. Um, and then we're going to have a huge wrap up on in December. I think it's about December the 6th. 
um, where we're actually having um, Annie Dye come to do the welcome. We're having Cheryl Lee Hood do some comedy with us. We're actually got a, uh, a singer and a dig player and it's going to go for an hour and a half. So it's a pretty full on um, let's wrap this up kind of session coming up in December. As usual, uh, application writing workshops on Monday the 25th are suitable to who, AJ? Mm, that's interesting. Um, Alex, do you know? Uh, so I can jump in on that one. Thanks, AJ. Um, the application writing workshop is for anyone who is thinking of applying for the fellowship program for leadership and change. So that's a, a program that Ajax runs um, twice a year. There's entrances to this and we've got one coming up now. So August the 12th, I believe, applications need to be put in. So anyone who is hoping to apply for that program is encouraged to attend that workshop on the 25th. Thanks, Nicole. No, thank you. So, guys, I will see you again next month. Please look after yourself, look after your family. I hope you all had a great NAD uh, NADOC that had just passed. And please don't just keep activities to NADOC week. Do them throughout the year. So until I see you next month, guys, look after yourself. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay warm. Bye. 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 Thanks, Thanks AJ. Thank you. Danny, Kelly, Kirsten, Sally, Henry. <laughs>